Thank you very much for that welcome, Lee. Um, it's always a bit, uh, bit confronting when someone reads out your CV and you realise how long it is uh, since you were at uni. And I was just uh, reflecting that I, I think my main reputation when I was at university studying agriculture was my propensity to, uh, to nod off during lectures. Um, uh, I used to have a bit of a problem staying awake, particularly after lunch. And uh, so I always think that it's only fair for others so afflicted that uh, in the case of a presentation like this, I should tell you the main message right now and get that out of the way. And uh, that way, if you're not off, at least you'll have got something out of the discussion. So I've got three main points uh, I want to take, uh, put in front of you and let you have a think about. Um, I think the first, and I guess we already know that, I'm not telling you anything new, is that in terms of trade, um, we in Australia are going to have to fight very hard, particularly in agriculture, for even minor trade concessions. And even once we've secured them, we seem to have to continue fighting to maintain them. So um, I think this whole issue of trade and access is going to be uh, a continuing struggle for agriculture in our uh, particular neck of the woods. I think the second one that I want you to think about as well uh, is expressed in this simple term. Proximity does little other than breed complacency. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, if I had a dollar for every time a minister or a politician has said, and these opportunities are going to emerge in our region, I'd be very wealthy. And, and the, the assumption seems to be that because it's in our region, the opportunities, um, that means we've got some God-given right or massive advantage in terms of uh, taking advantage of those opportunities. And I'm not sure that's correct, so I'll let you have a think about that. And the third point I want you to have a think about is um, Australian agriculture's reliance on its past reputation to justify price premiums doesn't seem to be a sustainable long-term strategy. Um, and we heard this discussion in the Minister's discussion yesterday that uh, we've got a reputation as good, reliable suppliers of high-quality product. And, and so therefore, even though our cost base has gone up here, we should be able to be successful in those markets. I, I don't think that quite hangs together as a logical uh, sequence of thinking. So I'll let you think about that. OK, so let's have a look at where we are in terms of uh, trade arrangements. Um, so we know we've got uh, a range of different concluded trade agreements, the Malaysia-Australian Free Trade Agreement. Um, that's still subject to ratification. Uh, we've got the ASEAN-Australia-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement uh, agreed in 2010. We've got the Australia-Chile Free Trade Agreement 2009, the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement 2005, Thailand, Singapore, and the Australian-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement um, negotiated back in 1983. So that basically is where we sit at the moment. If we looked at what's underway, um, the WTO Doha round, the, the, it might actually surprise some recent graduates of ag economics to know that uh, um, the, the negotiations for that round aren't a permanent feature of life that uh, they're expected to conclude at some stage. But uh, I think there are some probably ag economics graduates that have never known anything else other than that there's a round of Doha negotiations going on. So uh, that's taking a fair while. China we've been engaged with since 2005. Uh, the Gulf, 2007. India, just uh, 2011. Indonesia, 2012. Japan, going back to 2007. Uh, the Republic of Korea 2009, and the TPP, which Joe mentioned, uh, again kicked off in 2008. Um, so I guess what that tells us is that uh, we've got a series of agreements in place, um, and there are certainly some advantages coming out of them. We've got a lot of others that are underway, uh, including the Doha Round, and uh, it's uh, reasonable to say that um, progress is a bit patchy. Uh, we don't seem to be making any great strides. Um, so that's uh, what the environment looks like. Uh, we shouldn't belittle the fact that those agreements that we have managed to negotiate have brought some quite considerable advantage. So the ASEAN, Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement has certainly meant uh, 
that we've got multiple trade partners within that ASEAN grouping uh, with either zero or reduced tariff and certainly um, certainty of the bound tariff rates in, in places like Indonesia. So um, there's a group of countries there, um, albeit not necessarily major trade partners except perhaps for Indonesia, uh, where there's certainly some certainty being introduced as a consequence of that. The Malaysia Asian Free Trade Agreement uh, dairy, for example, has benefited from that uh, with increased liquid milk quotas, um, better access for retail uh, packed milk, and uh, some of the administration and cost overheads have certainly been uh, improved as a consequence of that. So that's been quite important. We've also managed to uh, negotiate uh, a better grain-fed beef quota to the EU, which is, of course, very important because it's uh, probably the highest value beef market uh, available to us, and that's certainly quite significant. Um, even in Chile, um, uh, I think in 2005, our beef exports to Chile were less than uh, $5 million, and that's grown uh, subsequent to that agreement to be now above $100 million a, a year. So um, even a country like that, where you wouldn't think there was naturally a uh, necessary uh, confluence of uh, trade interests, um, that's certainly been an advantage. Uh, getting Russia into the WTO, uh, I think the negotiations extended for 18 years, but uh, certainly it meant that Australia now has access to that 407,000 tonne frozen uh, beef quota and uh, an unlimited fresh or quality beef qu quota. Um, and they're certainly big advantages in terms of trade compared to what would have been the case otherwise. And uh, even more recently, we've seen horticulture cherries and uh, other products into um, China and the Philippines, and, and more recently, lamb access to India, which wasn't really part of a uh, specific uh, trade agreement. But certainly, um, we've seen some advances in, in regard to um, progress uh, on trade. There are, of course, a number of stumbling blocks, and uh, they are quite frustrating. Um, I think the investor state dispute settlement provisions uh, are a fairly major stumbling block in relation to the Korea free trade agreement. I think the minister mentioned them yesterday. Um, I think they're perhaps a little bit more prominent than, than uh, might have been mentioned. Um, that certainly uh, seems to be a major stumbling block and one that um, the US and others seem to have got around. Uh, the other issues we run into are, for example, uh, in negotiating agreements with China and Japan, um, there's a demand for preferential resource access agreements to things like energy and minerals um, and associated investment arrangements, um, which potentially run into issues in terms of the, the World Trade Organization Most Favoured Nation requirements. So there's um, some tension there potentially between the sort of interest that Japan and China, for example, have in securing negotiations with Australia that aren't related to agriculture um, and uh, some of the broader WTO frameworks, and that's certainly uh, a challenge. Um, there's nowhere, uh, we should, we should, we should no, I guess, not forget that whenever you come to agriculture, you've got a problem anyway. Um, so in all our um, trade agreements, uh, uh, with Japan or negotiations with Japan, with China, etc. Um, agriculture is always a stumbling block. So I guess we should never lose sight of the fact that um, we're in a sector that's always going to um, run into some problems. The other issue that seems to be emerging is an apparent increase in the use of technical barriers to trade. So even where um, we have a trade agreement negotiated, um, some of the technical requirements around uh, paperwork, around uh, biosecurity arrangements, around um, um, tracking and uh, physical uh, temperatures and those sorts of things um, seem to spring up and become a bit of an issue. And uh, we had one, for example, uh, thiocyanate in, in milk um, because Australian milk is essentially uh, pasture fed. Um, that varies depending on the pasture. Um, but uh, the concern from China was that when they did some testing, that, uh, that that may have been an additive put into the milk after, um, after uh, processing. So just getting those types of issues sorted out uh, really takes a lot of effort. And I think 
Um, certainly um, most of the major commodity sectors uh, in the sector, in agriculture in Australia would say uh, there seems to be an increase in the, 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 the effort and the time involved in trying to sort out uh, those sort of arrangements. Um, the other point, I guess, the other stumbling block is that whilst uh, we're uh, trying to get some of these agreements in place, uh, some of our competitors um, uh, have, have managed to get their agreements in place and therefore are already on the road and taking advantage of it. So if we look at the Korea Free Trade Agreement, the US already has uh, preferential access for beef into Korea. It's got about a 5.3% um, a, a five, 5 tariff advantage already. And every year that we don't secure that agreement, that's going to grow by about 2.7%. So we're already at a disadvantage there in terms of um, access to that market. And that uh, disadvantage is going to grow uh, over time if we don't secure an agreement there. Similarly with, uh, with China, New Zealand already has a free trade agreement with China. Their beef's going into China at about a 4% tariff. Ours uh, gets hit with a 12% tariff. So we're already, um, just the fact that we haven't completed those agreements um, really does uh, leave us at a disadvantage in terms of um, access to those markets. So um, a, a, a bit of a, uh, a mixed picture, um, I suspect a lot of those involved in Australian agriculture are um, somewhat jaundiced about the prospects of getting some of these agreements in place. Um, there's no doubt we've got some advantages from the ones we've managed to negotiate, um, but I suspect most in agriculture would be saying there looks to be a need for more vigour and more uh, uh, speed or more haste in trying to get uh, some of these others um, out of the way and sorted so that we can actually take advantage of the opportunities. If we then stand back a little bit from that and say, well, how have we been going in Asia? What, uh, we're, we're told that Asia's the big opportunity. Um, what's the situation look like? What's our trade performance to date look like? Um, certainly, uh, when we look at what we export, um, it, it probably comes as no surprise that it's the old staples uh, that dominate in terms of the, the value of exports. So uh, wheat, beef, wool, cotton, and uh, sheep meats and those sort of things are, are the big ticket items and they're, they're commodities. So I know that there's a lot of discussion about the opportunity to take advantage of niche premium markets, but uh, when it boils down, when you look at the numbers, um, the big ticket items are really those commodities and uh, it's not always um, an opportunity for niche markets in those sort of products. If we look at the value of our agricultural exports by region, and this includes um, both uh, commodity exports and also processed foods. Um, so uh, if we look at the picture, um, it's quite clear that Asia, and by this I'm including all Asia, so North Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia, so the subcontinent. So um, when we look at the numbers, um, it's quite clear how significant Asia is and how significant it's become over the last uh, few years in terms of our total agricultural exports. So um, there's no doubt that um, Asia is uh, quite critical and uh, that we have been uh, seeing some gains in those markets. Um, if we look at it from a percentage perspective of our uh, total agricultural exports, um, we can see that Asia is now up at around that 60% uh, of um, total agricultural exports. So. Um, there's no doubt that uh, that's certainly a very major market for us when we put those figures together. If we look at what the main exports are that are going to that Asian market, um, that graph gives you a picture. Um, I guess uh, dairy, quite important, meat, quite important, um, and then cereals is the interesting one. So cereals is the orangey coloured one um, you can see there, fourth from the bottom, and you can see that a lot of that growth that we saw in the previous graph um, uh, to Asia is in fact in the value of cereals exports to Asia. So um, again, I guess it reinforces that it's, it's not the high quality, um, if you like, or the high value products or the, the processed products, but it's in fact cereals that are um, the big growth area, and uh, that's consistent with 
um, some of the discussion we've had before. And again, if we look at it by country, and sorry this uh, graph is a bit busy, but I guess you get the main picture, and that's the red line, uh, which is China. So uh, again, uh, subsequent to that 2007-2008 soft commodity price uh, spike, um, the, the growth has been there in China, and it now uh, dominates, in fact, is, uh, has overtaken uh, uh, Japan as our main market. So, um, and, and some of the others, there's a, there's a little bit of growth in them, but uh, probably nowhere near as significant as that change in China. Um, I guess uh, the interesting question from our perspective is, given the background in uh, trade negotiations and trade agreements, what's happening in terms of our share of uh, the sort of trade that's going on in Asia, that growth of Asia? Because that's obviously the important thing. If, if growth's going on but we're losing share, uh, then we're certainly at a disadvantage. So if you look at the overall picture of um, uh, agricultural imports, into Asia over the last uh, period since 1960. Um, you see that quite dramatic increase in the value of imports from around that 2003-2004 period. Um, a, a bit of a setback in terms of the global financial crisis, but uh, uh, growth again, and these figures finish at 2010. So I think even subsequent to that, we'd see further growth. So certainly there has been spectacular growth in, in overall demand uh, for imports through Asia. Now, a lot of those are being supplied by um, inter-Asian trade, so it's not just uh, the fact that um, overseas regions are supplying those products. There's, uh, there's obviously within Asia trade as well. To try and get a picture of how we're going, though, if we index those total agricultural imports into Asia um, back to 1990 and start with uh, an index of 100, say, at 1990, um, then uh, the red line is in fact uh, what's happened on, on an index basis to, uh, to agricultural imports into Asia since that time. If we then look at um, uh, an index of Australian exports of agricultural products to Asia since that time, um, that's what you get on the green line. So as a very crude and rough picture, what it tends to show us is that we've been doing okay um, but there's some question marks over the latter years. So uh, in the last few years, it seems as if um, the index of uh, the, the rate of agricultural imports into Asia has been growing faster than uh, the index of Australian exports to Asia. So I guess it gives us a little bit of a warning uh, signal that certainly in value terms, um, uh, we seem to be dropping off the pace, although the um, statistics are a bit uh, a bit uh, un, un, com, incomplete towards the latter end of that period. I think the other thing that's worth having a look at is um, how much of that product that we're exporting to Asia is processed. So in other words, how much of it is um, uh, undergoing value adding here in Australia and being exported as essentially food rather than raw commodities. Um, uh, the, there can be some arguments about what you put in uh, what category. For example, where does meat go? Is meat a processed product or is meat still a raw commodity? Certainly if you include um, or if you work under the assumption that most of the meat exported is, is unbranded product, it's, uh, it's basically a commodity export, um, and you look at the numbers there, uh, we were certainly increasing to some degree our processed uh, exports as a proportion of total up to about the late 90s, but since that time um, we've been um, declining uh, in terms of the proportion of processed food as opposed to uh, basically bulk commodities going over there. Now I think um, this is quite important because um, it, it's quite significant background to the issue of um, how or what reputation Australia has because it essentially tells us that um, it's not Australian food manufacturers or Australian dairy manufacturers that are um, making uh, big progress in terms of access to those Asian markets. It's, it's basically raw commodities and uh, that's certainly something to think about. Uh, there's not a great surprise in that sort of trend. We know there's two factors been working against us uh, since that period of time. Um, the first is uh, the exchange rate, and and doesn't matter what you use, whether it's the US dollars or a trade-weighted index, um, we've been progressively 
um, uh, on the wrong side of the ledger from an exporter's perspective um, since about 2000. And that's certainly uh, a significant factor in terms of not only the prices for um, um, uh, agricultural commodities, but also uh, the prices received by uh, manufactured uh, food exporters. So that's certainly quite significant. I think the other thing is that um, uh, somehow Australia seems to have crept up the table in terms of uh, relative wage rates. So if you look at uh, data, for example, from the International Labor Organization on a, on a, um, a purchasing power parity basis, Australia is now about the fourth uh, highest minimum wage rate in the world. Um, so we're behind only, I think it's uh, Denmark, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, so Australia's the green and gold bar, they're the fourth bar. Um, some of our major competitors are highlighted in other colours there. So you see New Zealand in black, uh, the USA red, white and blue, um, Argentina in the, in the blue and white, and then Brazil, uh, Russia and, uh, and the Ukraine. So it's probably no surprise when you look at that, that uh, manufactured uh, processes in Australia are struggling because uh, obviously uh, wages are a quite significant component of the sort of cost base that they face. And uh, when uh, we're paying those sort of wages in Australia and trying to compete with um, other exporters who are paying significantly less, any uh, export that's got an element of um, uh, trade, uh, sorry, of, of wage costs as, as a significant input cost um, is always going to suffer. So certainly those two, the exchange rate effect and the wage rate effect uh, are certainly not um, surprising. It's not surprising that in fact uh, the processed uh, food sector in Australia seems to be less successful in securing additional exports into those markets. So that, uh, I think the, the picture that emerges from that is yes, we've been doing well in terms of uh, uh, securing some of that Asian market, um, but there's some warning signs there that suggest we're not necessarily uh, having uh, all the success that we might have. And I guess that leads to that question I left you with, um, which is, uh, you know, we're told that Asia's in our region and therefore um, we've, got, we've got the jump start, if you like, in terms of success in those markets. And I thought it was interesting to see, well, is proximity that much of an advantage? Um, and so what we did was uh, go around uh, one of the major uh, shipping lines that services uh, the whole globe and get quotes for a 40-foot refrigerated container of boxed, frozen or chilled beef from various export ports uh, to Shanghai as, as say, for example, a, a, a port in China that might be uh, an appropriate one. And so you see there that we've got uh, uh, shipments potentially coming from uh, Brazil, from Argentina, from Chile, uh, from uh, Houston in the Gulf of Mexico, from uh, Los Angeles and from Australia and all going to uh, the same port, the same port of Shanghai. And you can fit about somewhere between 24, 25 tonnes net in a 40 foot refrigerated container and so you can work it back to um, a cents per kilo basis. And so the results uh, are interesting I think. Um, if you look there, the, uh, the dearest uh, price was probably um, out of Houston and, and some of these depend a little bit on the, the frequency of shipping and the size of the boats that are available uh, to carry containers. Um, but that was about the dearest and the cheapest was uh, Santos out of Brazil to Shanghai, 32 cents a kilo. Then when you look at the Melbourne uh, Shanghai price, uh, it works out at about 20 cents a kilo. So what that tells us is that all this discussion about proximity and opportunity in our regions uh, on a pure uh, shipping uh, cost basis boils down to about 12 cents a kilo. Uh, uh, and and uh, I suspect that some of you in the room would be uncomfortable with the fact that that's all the advantage that um, our proximity to Asia gives us. Um, because certainly if we looked at the impact of the exchange rate changes over the last um, perhaps decade, or if we looked at the impact of uh, relative wage costs in Australia over the last decade, I think you could find fairly quickly that there's more than 12 cents a kilo cost uh, from those two factors alone that would negate any potential freight advantage. Now there are other advantages in terms of uh, shipping times, um, and, and so a customer might be prepared to pay a bit more to get product a bit more quickly. 
but when it boils down to it, um, that sort of 12 to, to maybe 20 cents a kilo, if you're generous, is the only advantage that, uh, that proximity seems to bring us, bring us in terms of price. And I'd suggest to you that's not uh, a huge margin. I think the other thing, and, and I wish we could get this into uh, common understanding a bit more, the other thing is if you ask for a quote out of Darwin uh, uh, to Shanghai, you can't get a quote because there isn't a regular refrigerated um, uh, shipping line. And if you could get a quote, it'd actually be dearer than Melbourne. Um, so the number of people that point to Darwin and say, well, that's, that's right next to Asia, we must have a big advantage there, I think they'd be somewhat surprised to learn that, in fact, it's a disadvantage. Uh, the freight rates out of Darwin, for example, for a container of uh, fr refrigerated or frozen beef are actually higher than those out of Melbourne. So um, uh, just my, my word of caution that I'm not convinced that proximity uh, gives us all the advantages that we think it does. So I guess then we ask the question, well, if proximity's uh, a bit of a gain but not a huge advantage, can we sustain um, uh, market share in Asia given we've got very high costs compared to some of our competitors and, and, and our proximity doesn't really give us that much of an advantage? And I think that's a real open question. And I'm going to put up uh, an example that I think is useful uh, just to give us a bit of perspective on this. So um, this is an example of a promotion by the Danish Agriculture and Food Council. And the Danish Agriculture and Food Council is a collective organisation that includes farmers, processors, everyone involved in the food industry in Dan Denmark. Um, and so they've got a quite major um, promotion around the fact that they've got very safe uh, product, uh, very high quality product, and they run very sustainable agriculture in Denmark. And this is pitched directly at the market in China. This whole campaign is pitched directly at the market in China and particularly at um, the high uh, income consumer market in China. And it's got a whole range of uh, aspects to it. Um, but I think the most uh, interesting one is um, Denmark saying that as part of its um, support and access to the Chinese market, it will also help China uh, get reciprocal access to uh, markets like the EU. So, so a very deliberate strategy uh, by a very small nation right at the other end of the world where proximity, you would think, would be a major disadvantage, um, promoting itself as a supplier of high quality, um, uh, sustainable, environmentally friendly, um, uh, safe food to the upper end of the, the Chinese food market. Um, and I guess I'll leave you with the question. Uh, we here like to say we're clean and green and sustainable and therefore, uh, despite our cost disadvantages, we should have uh, a preferential opportunity to, uh, to be able to sell our product into, um, into a market like China, particularly the high value consumer market. Um, New Zealand's already do doing that and they've got a free trade agreement. Denmark's doing that and they're right at the other side of the world. And as far as I know, we're not doing it. Uh, as far as I know, um, there's no specific campaign or promotion on behalf of Australian agriculture uh, to, to market our credentials and market why uh, consumers in uh, countries like uh, uh, China should look at Australian product at a price premium and prepared, be prepared to pay for it. So um, I think there's a real issue there about the extent to which uh, we are somewhat complacent about proximity, somewhat complacent about the quality and the standards that we provide, and just expecting consumers in countries like uh, China, and particularly the high wealth consumers, to pay for it. Um, and, and I know that the rational economists in the room would say, well, the market will sort that out because the manufacturers will, will tout their brand and, and, and carry us into the, uh, into the market, but I think uh, when you look at those earlier numbers, um, Australian manufacturers aren't going to carry us into the market under their brand names. Um, we are still uh, a commodity supplier into those markets. So I think there's a real question there about uh, whether Australia is doing enough to promote its credentials as a food, uh, a quality food supplier into those uh, emerging markets and therefore uh, 
to be able to gain market share as those markets grow. So again, I'll leave you with the three points I started with in case you nodded off. Um, we're going to have to fight hard for even minor trade concessions and continue fighting to maintain them. Proximity, I think, does little other than breed complacency on behalf of Australian agriculture. And our reliance on our past reputation to justify price premiums, I don't think is a sustainable long-term strategy. So I have some real questions about uh, whether Australia is actually going to do all that well uh, in terms of agricultural trade in the Asian century. Thank you.